So um, glutathione and aging. Wow, I, I, I know that the function of glutathione and aging has been one of the most asked about questions that y'all will encounter. Uh, it, it's a it's a huge topic, and it's been the topic of many, many research articles, literally thousands of them. Uh, we, could, we could spend a week talking about this, but don't worry, uh, we'll be done uh, before midnight. <laughs> but first, for those of you new on these calls, let's do a quick review on the topic of glutathione. Uh, glutathione is a, a substance that already exists in your body. Uh, in fact, it appears in the cells of every living creature and plant in the world, not just humans. A life as we know it could not exist were it not for this remarkable substance. So when I first started lecturing about glutathione over 25 years ago, um, it was a word that almost no one had heard of, including doctors. Uh, if I asked in an, in an audience of 300 people, uh, who's heard of this word? Uh, very few hands went up. And here we are today. And now many, many people have heard of it, especially in the medical community and more and more in the general public. Now, why? Uh, because right now, if you check on PubMed, Gov, you'll find over 175,000 published articles that deal with glutathione. Now, just to let you know, PubMed is the main repository of research articles in the world. It has almost all of the most prevalent journals listed on it, and every research is on a researcher is on this site every day. If you want to find an original research article, this is the place you'll check first and probably find it. So just to uh, uh, put this into uh, context, um, if you want to find uh, an article on vitamin C, um, that's probably going to show up at about 40 different, 40,000 different art, uh, articles, uh, vitamin E, uh, uh, another 70. So glutathione has more articles written on it than vitamin C and vitamin E put together. So in these 175,000 articles, you can develop a list of options that glutathione carries out in your body. And that list will be dozens of subjects long. Uh, many of these roles would not be understandable to most, but I've broken them down into uh, these roles into four easy to remember things. So if you could remember these four major functions, you'll probably know 90% of what glutathione does in your body. So just remember, glutathione, what a great idea. What do these letters stand for? I stands for the immune system. D stands for detoxification. E stands for energy. And A stands for antioxidant. Let's look at these in turn. Uh, if we look at the immune system, uh, glutathione is literally food or fuel for the immune system. Um, People with low glutathione levels are going to be immunocompromised. Um, people with uh, optimized glutathione are going to optimize their immune response. Uh, D is for detoxification. And I tell people that next to water, there's probably no more important detoxification substance in the body. Uh, detoxifies uh, uh, cigarette smoke and automobile exhaust and pesticides and herbicides and, and all those things that come out of smoke stacks. And by no coincidence, the highest levels of glutathione to be found in your body is in your liver, which is, after all, your major organ of detoxification. E uh, uh, stands for energy. Uh, our, our little mitochondria, those little batteries that supply energy to your cells, uh, they would literally burn up uh, from free radical damage uh, were it not for a constant supply of glutathione. And finally, A, 
uh, for antioxidant. This is the role that most people know about glutathione. Uh, we call glutathione the master antioxidant, and we do that because all of the anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 different antioxidants that have been described, these antioxidants could not work without the presence of glutathione. Jimmy, oh, Dr. Yeah. Gilman, sorry to interrupt. Um, could everyone please just check the mute? We're getting some background noise, so if you could just check yourself and then please mute yourself. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it sounded like somebody was having a bowl of immunocal and yogurt or something. <laughs> All right. So uh, with these four main functions in mind, you could start to appreciate why uh, glutathione has such a profound effect in your body and why it holds such enormous Hang on one sec, Jimmy. We've been master muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Sorry. There. You're back. Okay. You just missed uh, just the last couple of sentences. Okay. I'll, I'll just start from the beginning because we are recording and uh, it'll be cleaner that way. Um, so with these four main functions, you can start to appreciate um, why glutathione has such a, an incredible effect on your body and why it holds such huge potential in keeping you healthy and treating health issues. Uh, in fact, the number of health issues uh, which is uh, tied to glutathione um, uh, and in, described in literature increases every month. Uh, it's a challenge to keep on top of all this. Uh, and, and this will be a good place to take advantage and and plug my my book here um uh, I, i've done the work for you my, my my latest book on glutathione is the most complete reference guide to the subject and i've i've gone through thousands of references to write it and uh, the book is referenced uh, itself chapter by chapter and it covers an enormous list of topics including today's topic aging. So let's take a, a closer look at aging now. Uh, an incredibly popular subject, that, especially among baby, baby boomers, but um, you youngsters out there, pay attention. Uh, one day uh, you will be involved. Um, this is uh, a disease, aging, that all of you are suffering from, and I hope that you suffer from this disease for a long time. Um, there are still people out there who scoff at anti-aging medicine, but this has become an established field with its own specialty exams at conferences and, and journals. But for those of you out there to still have some doubts about this, let me point out the following. Uh, when I ask uh, people, what was the average life expectancy of a man at the turn of the 20th century? And the answer is 47 years old, 47 years. Uh, when I was in high school, I was taught that an American man had a life expectancy of 65 years old. That's not that long ago. Uh, nowadays, the number is around 80 years old. Uh, the number I'm showing here is from 2019 because after COVID came in, there was a, a significant drop. So we've actually been practicing anti-aging medicine for over 100 years. Uh, so nothing new here other than a stronger focus on the aging process. Now, here's an interesting graph. Um, some of you have seen this before. Uh, we see that glutathione levels drop consistently as we age, about 10% per decade of life. Uh, so someone my age, uh, I could be at about half that level um, uh, I, if I wasn't doing something about it. So the level goes down and down the older we get. But wait, something strange is going on here at the end of the graph. Uh, when you measure glutathione levels in people, who are like 100 years old, 
all of a sudden you find that this group has relatively high glutathione levels. Why? Well, the answer is that's why they're 100 years old. They've had the inherent ability, genetic or environmental, to maintain high levels of glutathione. And this allowed them to survive to be 100. Uh, their friends and enemies who did not have this capacity had all died off. This is natural selection at its best. So this leads us to the question, have researchers actually looked at whether there is a true correlation between glutathione levels and longevity? Let's take a look. Uh, nowadays, um, with the rapid development of DNA and gene sequencing, um, we've discovered that there are several glutathione genes that we all have encoded. And within these groups of genes, there are variations. Many people, in fact, have abnormal glutathione genetics. And this has become more and more apparent as these tests become more available. Uh, scientists are doing a lot of this type of work now, correlating gene abnormalities with different disease states to be able to do prognosis testing and, and working out hopefully potential treatments and cures. Now, a lot of studies have correlated abnormal glutathione genes with the likelihood of developing different cancers or lung disease or other problems. Uh, this study here um, uh, it looks at glutathione abnormalities and longevity specifically. Uh, many other uh, studies are available. So people with abnormal glutathione genes don't live as long. Another approach is to look specifically at the group of people who display exceptional longevity. Here, researchers connected uh, available articles in the medical literature looking at individuals who are 97 years or older and compared them to a younger age group in terms of markers of oxidative stress. And as expected, these people had significantly higher levels of glutathione enzymes. Another clear correlation, long-lived people have higher levels of glutathione level. Uh, this study here looked, uh, uh, took the opposite approach. It concluded that the risk of dying increases with the diet low in cysteine, which after all is the limiting factor for the cellular production of glutathione. Uh, they're promoting the use of glutathione precursors to be a focus of a healthy diet in the elderly to decrease mortality or death. So mortality is correlated with a lower intake of glutathione precursors. Now, I take you back over 30 years ago to one of Dr. Gustavo Bunas's earlier studies. Uh, this was shortly after his team discovered that the main way that their recently discovered protein worked uh, was by raising glutathione, the great grandfather of Immunical. And one of the breakthrough studies here happened when a group of laboratory animals showed increased resistance to disease and in certain cases, cancer. Now, this study uh, was, was published uh, demonstrating that these animals lived anywhere between 30 and 50% longer this was a, a huge discovery and certainly garnered a lot of attention and, and fortunately further funding. And, and even today, people are sending me studies showing uh, what's considered a remarkable substance that prolonged the life of a rat of a, or a mouse by 10%. Well, geez, we did better than that. <laughs> we did it uh, over 30 years ago with, with the Munical. Now, of course, it would be nice to do such a study in humans, but uh, this would be pretty much impossible to do. Um, it would be too difficult to control all the variables that took place in a human's lifespan. And, and besides that, try to get 80 years of funding for a project. However, 
all of this has been done multiple times in mice as well as in other laboratory animals. Uh, the, the bottom line is raising glutathione levels in laboratory animals will lead to an increased longevity. Very clear. So we've discovered some basics about glutathione and aging. Let, let's took, take a look at some uh, diseases of aging. Uh, let's look at health and glutathione in general in an older population. Uh, here's a study done in Florida looking at geriatric patients. I guess if you're going to do a geriatric study, Florida is a, a great place <laughs> to, to do it all. Um, they looked at four populations. Young volunteers, shown in blue. Healthy older people. Uh, healthy meaning they were only went to see a doctor if they needed to in, in green. Older outpatients, the yellow box, who had regular visits to the doctor for checkups, uh, blood pressure checks, uh, drug refills, that kind of thing. And finally, geriatric patients that were admitted to the hospital in red. And they measured glutathione levels in all of these populations. And look, a perfect correlation between glutathione levels and their degree of health. Very revealing. The higher the glutathione, the higher the level of health. Here's a European study, a study uh, published in the journal uh, Gerontology, a newer term for geriatrics. Uh, the scientists measured glutathione levels in over 2,500 people over the age of 60. This is a very large study. And then they listed what's called multimorbidity. What is multimorbidity? It's the development of different chronic diseases over time, like diabetes, COPD, heart disease, etc. Morbidity means illness. Multimorbidity means multiple illnesses. So they matched up glutathione levels and the accumulation of diseases over six years. This is quite um, an undertaking. And so multimorbidity itself can be considered as the most common clinical condition linked to aging. In other words, most aged people are suffering from more than one illness. And of course, uh, this is going to affect both their physical and mental health and certainly their quality of life. And as you could have predicted, there was a perfect correlation, again, between glutathione levels and multimorbidity. In other words, the lower the glutathione levels were, the more chronic diseases were present. Very important to understand. So what are specific diseases of aging? Uh, there really is a long list, but let's look at some of the more uh, common ones. Uh, here's a short list. Just take a look. Uh, includes cancer, heart disease, stroke, arthritis, uh, neurodegenerative disease, and so on. Um, and you, you could probably think of a dozen more uh, on your own. Now, here's the thing, and I want you to remember this. Each and every one on the list here is related to glutathione deficiency. It's impossible to count the number of studies that have demonstrated this. Glutathione levels are inversely correlated to the most common diseases of aging in the Western world. I mean, this slide alone uh, um, uh, is represents the 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 uh, main message of tonight's webinar. Uh, take cancer, for example. Uh, the incidence of cancer in the population shows a dramatic increase as we get older. Sure, uh, easily think of something like prostate cancer as age-related, but so is colon cancer, breast cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, and, and so on. Aging is a clear risk factor for the development of cancer. And I'm not going to do a discussion of glutathione in cancer. We've 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 covered this in several other webinars. I, I will, however, welcome you to view this topic. Uh, you can find a, a presentation on glutathione and cancer on the YouTube address 
on the slide here. So I'll keep it up there for a second or two for you to uh, jot it down. Immunosenescence. Here's a word that is new to most of you. Uh, it describes the weakening of the immune system with age. You probably haven't heard this word because it's not a disease itself. It's a, a natural process that comes along with aging. You get older, your immune system gets older, and most often it's weaker. Uh, this, this can be shown with uh, cell counts and uh, functionality of specific uh, immune cells. Uh, here's a chart from a study looking at glutathione levels in the white blood cells of different age groups. Uh, the white blood cells are the immune system's frontline soldiers, and they go by different names, including uh, lymphocytes. And here we see a steady decline in white blood cell glutathione levels as an individual ages. This is correlated with the weakening of the immune system's functioning over age. I need to mention cataracts here because this was one of the first places that glutathione levels were found to be depressed uh, with the occurrence of disease. Uh, this was reported by ophthalmologists many, many years ago and uh, actually stimulated others to research glutathione levels in other tissues as well. Uh, this article here uh, describes a progressive loss of glutathione in the lens of the eye that occurs with aging. Um, they are promising effective strategies of raising glutathione levels in the eye as a potential treatment. Now, I know a lot of people on this call have had experience with the glutathione precursor Immunical. I keep on hearing stories about people with cataracts being followed by eye doctors, some of which who have had cataract, cataract surgery planned who have had to cancel surgery because of improvement in the cataract. I'm, 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 I'm sure you, you've heard uh, some of the same um, testimonials. Now, no discussion of diseases of aging would miss Alzheimer's disease as a major entity. In fact, next to cancer, uh, this is one of the diseases that middle-aged and older people fear the most. Uh, over one in 10 people over the age of 65 will get Alzheimer's. And th that number is probably a low estimate since many cases go undiagnosed or unreported. Uh, the official number goes up to a full third of individuals over the age of 85. So very prevalent. This has been uh, thoroughly studied. Uh, glutathione levels are very low in patients with Alzheimer's disease, and the level of glutathione impairment, get this, correlates with the degree of severity of disease. Uh, many neuroscientists have suggested that following glutathione levels is a good way to develop prognosis in these patients. And more importantly, researchers are actively studying ways of improving cognition in Alzheimer's disease by raising glutathione. So for those of you involved with Immunical, you have heard uh, many, many anecdotes about this. So we've discovered that glutathione levels are clearly depleted, uh, depleted in Alzheimer's disease, but what about milder forms of dementia? What about in MCI, or which stands for mild cognitive impairment, MCI? The answer is yes, glutathione levels fall in MCI. So what is MCI? Mild cognitive impairment is a state where there are early changes in, for example, memory. Uh, it's all too common for a 60-year-old person not to remember somebody's name that they just met or to lose their keys or misplace their eyeglasses. But these annoying things don't really affect their ability to get through the day. In fact, I'll bet the majority of 60-year-olds on this call can relate to what I'm saying. Uh, these people cannot be considered as suffering from dementia, but having this condition often will eventually lead to Alzheimer's. In other words, 
MCI, mild cognitive impairment, is a risk factor for the development of future full-blown dementia. And guess what? MCI patients can also be defined as having lower glutathione levels. Uh, let's look at this study here that followed glutathione levels for two years in patients diagnosed with MCI. Uh, glutathione levels were tested every six months. And here, if we looked at that marked column, you will see a very concerning loss of glutathione continually through that time period. This screams out for something to be done. And this brings us back to McGill University, where most of the studies on Immunical originated. Neuroscientists now at McGill are finishing up a rather remarkable study that really has to be considered cutting edge. Get this, they are using a special MRI brain scanner developed to measure glutathione levels in a living brain. This now can be done. This, the scanner is tuned to pick up on glutathione signals. And this team is actually scanning the brains of MCI patients before and after putting them on Immunical. And at the same time, uh, doing cognitive testing to follow their progress. The idea is to correlate Immunical ingestion with both improvement in brain glutathione and reducing or improving cognitive decline. Just fantastic. And I will let you all know when this is published. I can't wait. Well, what about Parkinson's disease? Does the loss of glutathione take place in, in other neurodegenerative disease? Well, I've, I've done a, a, a lot of research in neurodegeneration and glutathione, and there are multiple chapters in my latest book on glutathione that look at these different neurodegenerative diseases. And it is an all too common issue occurring in the majority of neurodegeneration we see today, glutathione deficiency. In this study, uh, brains uh, were obtained at autopsy. Uh, they didn't have the glutathione measuring uh, MRI machine, and glutathione levels were compared between Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients, and normal individuals. And as expected, glutathione levels were decreased in both of these diseases as compared to unaffected brains. Uh, other papers have shown that the greatest decrease in glutathione in the Parkinsonian brain is in specific tissues affected in Parkinson's that being a region of the brain called the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia region. Uh, sometimes a drop uh, to only a few percentage of normal glutathione levels. So can glutathione levels, uh, raising them, can it help? Uh, these doctors here used a, an instrument to measure the actual shaking of a Parkinson's patient. As you know, there's a particular type of tremor uh, seen in this disease. Uh, so the baseline tremor is showing up uh, on top. Uh, then the patient was given intravenous glutathione and the tremor was quite noticeably improved as you see in the middle graph. Unfortunately, intravenous glutathione is short-lived. So after the study, the patient went back to his original level of shaking. So we can go on and on looking at diseases of aging and showing the correlation to glutathione uh, depletion. But for the sake of time, let me say this, the vast majority of diseases of aging are related to a loss of glutathione and much work is being done looking at correcting this. Uh, this is an area of very active interest and more and more articles come out every month. Uh, like I said, it's a challenge to keep on top of all this. Uh, and all of this research has led to glutathione being a key molecule in their understanding and application of anti-aging strategies.